All right. Hey, friends from Facebook. This is Patrick with the Poison Pen, and I'm here with the great Tosca Lee, um, here for her latest novel, The Line Between. Thank you so much for braving Phoenix Geddon, as I'd like to call Phoenix it. Phoenix Geddon. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So um, for those of you who don't live in Phoenix, um, Phoenicians freak out when rain just starts plummeting from the sky, and we've actually got a really unusual winter storm that's just coming through the entire state and just dumping a ton of snow and rain all over the valley and none of us drive or know how to drive when it rains and the streets flood. So, uh, you know, it, thank you for, for braving this. <laughs> it's my pleasure. <laughs> it, you know, where I'm from, that rain is, is snow. So, you know, this is, I much prefer this. So where is home for you, Tosca? It's Nebraska. Oh, yes. So you get yeah. dumped on, and you're yes. getting dumped on probably right now, I know. Right now, and more on Saturday, I think. So I think it's going to be, yeah, a lot. I feel bad, because we usually have sunshine. It's usually be beautiful. You, you can go out. Down, you can... I know. <laughs> I guess I'll have to come back. Yeah. You will, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, the story's yours whenever you'd like to come back. Okay. So we'd love to have, have you back when it's it's more beautiful. So... This is a really cool book, The Line Between. Um, Simon & Schuster has really been um, promoting your novel, which is really which is always very exciting when a publisher gets behind a book, but this is a really interesting speculative fiction book. Can you give us a little bit of a uh, premise for this new novel? Absolutely. Well, this is the story of a young woman who's 22 years old, and her name is Winter Roth. And um, she's named after my stepdaughter, actually, her, whose name is Winter, with a Y. And she's just been ousted from a doomsday cult on the American Prairie in Iowa, next door to Nebraska, where I live. <laughs> Sorry, Iowa. And um, she, as she's been let out, this uh, disease has recently been released from the uh, Alaskan permafrost um, that's been melting, of course. And so she gets out, and this pandemic begins, and to her, it looks like the apocalypse that she's always been told was coming. And so that's the, the beginning of the story. Exactly. And she gets involved with the cult and has to escape the cult? She Yes, she's trying to escape the cult. She gets expelled from the cult. She has to start life over in the outside world, which for her is very disorienting. And, um, and especially in the middle of a pandemic. So, um, yeah. And it's, it ends up being a run for your life, race across the, the Midwest um, adventure, so. Which is, this is a little bit different from what you usually, I, I wouldn't say what you usually write, but from your early beginnings where you were primarily a historical fiction writer, right. especially focusing on um, the Bible and Christian Biblical, fiction. Yeah. yeah, so this is a little different. The last two books before this were also thrillers with a little bit of a historical edge. Uh, the Progeny and Firstborn, and so they kind of formed, um, there was a, a mythology behind the story there based on Elizabeth Bathory, um, and so I'm, I'm still in that thriller genre, but it is kind of a, a little bit of a turn from that biblical, early biblical fiction, but Queen of Sheba and Judas Iscariot and Eve from the Bible. Exactly, and also writing with uh, co-writer Ted Decker. Decker, yeah, which is trilogy too, together, yeah. So what was that like? What's it like working with somebody that you're co-writing a book with, with in terms of doing that, and writing something like a thriller where you're uh, fully on your own? Um, I get asked that a lot, and I know a lot of authors who co-write with other authors, and as far as I can tell, every team does it differently. Um, and you know, we did a trilogy together, and of that trilogy, every book that we did was different. So that first book, you're kind of you know, learning how to work together. And the thing I always say to people who are interested in, in writing with someone else, because I get a lot of questions about this, um, is always know what your strengths are as a writer and know what you're bringing to the table. And that goes for any partnership um, so that you know how you can complement one another. We have uh, Doug Preston, Lincoln Child. Lincoln does yes. everything via Skype, and Doug will come in to the bookstore. Right. And they write the uh, Pendergast series, and they have a completely different method of writing their books. And every time we get a duo who writes a book that's a duo, like you said, it is completely different. But by the time you're done, you get this completely unique voice. Yes. 
And that is one of the things that I noticed with your trilogy with Ted Decker is that it's not Ted's voice, it's not your voice, it is a completely different kind of third party voice. So I'm really curious, how do, how do you do that? How do you, how do you differentiate your own voice and kind of create and meld this third voice together? So I liken it to when you're doing a piece of furniture or something and you put layers of lacquer over and over and over until you get this really nice finish. Uh, Ted and I have very different voices. Though that said, he is now doing biblical fiction and I'm doing thrillers, which he was doing thrillers before and I was doing <laughs> biblical fiction. Um, so we would rewrite, we would write and then rewrite one another's work and pass it back and forth and rewrite it so that it ended up sounding like both of us, but also not like either one of us. So you get that unique voice. But it's very time consuming. It's an incredibly time consuming process. It's why you can only produce a book every year to year and a half mm -hmm. uh, as you're publishing because it takes that extra time to really make sure that that voice is not just yours and it's not just his. Yeah. Um, did you learn, what did you learn as you were writing those books with Ted in terms of thriller writing and how did you apply it to this new book, The Line Between? Well, as you know, Ted's been doing thrillers for quite a long time and um, he's a fan of um, keeping things moving very quickly. And so at, when you're doing that, you know, for that series, um, for instance, you just get used to that pacing. And so that kind of breakneck pacing is kind of, you know, what I'm after whenever I write a thriller now. So my, my happiest moment is when somebody says, I couldn't put it down and I stayed up all night and I called in sick for work or school or whatever. <laughs> not that I really advocate calling in sick for work or saying you're sick when you're not because you stayed up all night, but I do take it as a personal badge of honor. So yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> so it's a, just to speak for myself, it's a really bad habit. I usually, I, I have a day job and then I come in here and I get the chance to sell books and talk to people about books and I love that part of it. And then I get home and I'm like, okay, I need to unwind. So I, I pick up a book and I start reading and the line between just really grabbed me. And I've got to say that I stayed up way too late last night reading your book um, <laughs> to prepare for this. and enjoyably so because it's it really is an exciting exciting novel thank you um where did it come from where did this idea kind of stem from because it is a little bit different from your previous works so i had a meeting in new york city with my publisher and i was taking kind of a short list with me of ideas and one of the ideas i had was based on a recent headline about this reindeer i think it was in siberia that had recently thawed with the permafrost but it happened to be infected with anthrax, and this nearby Siberian village um, got sick with anthrax, and a small boy died, actually. And I was just fascinated with this idea of these things in the permafrost coming out, and there's actually a lot of articles from uh, about scientists being very nervous about what's in there and what could come back out. They're, they've even found seeds that are very, very old, thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of years old that are viable. And so I was fascinated with that. And then I had this separate idea of a girl trying to start over after being expelled from a self-contained cult. And so I went to this meeting, there were other ideas on that list too, but I went to this meeting and I took these two ideas in and my publisher said, I like both of these, why don't you put them together? And I was like, huh, <laughs> I hadn't really thought of that before, but um, I really liked the way it turned out and I've received many compliments on those two ideas being kind of mashed up together, but I can't take credit. I wish I could. So, hi. I, I want to squeeze him so badly. This is this is Paul, he's my rescue dog. Uh, he Hello. comes with me every now and again to work and he will just interrupt the show. So sorry, Facebook, I hope you like dogs. So. <laughs> there's, there's a little dog like that in the line between actually, so. Aww. Yep. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, you can't, you can't kill a dog in fiction. So does it ever put you, do, do you enjoy writing in animals and, and within your, your books knowing that you know no harm can come to them? Um, yeah, no, you, you definitely cannot kill a dog in, in a book. You can kill people in the most heinous ways ever, but you cannot kill a dog <laughs> at all. Um, and I, I, I introduced the dog's name as Buddy in the story, and I introduced Buddy knowing that he could not ever die. So. That's always, that's always good to know, and good to have in peril. Speculative fiction is uh, becoming really hot right now. 
um, with A Handmaid's Tale on Hulu, and then uh, Pong Shepard just came out with her book, The Book of M, and uh, Station Eleven, you know, being such a big hit a couple years ago. Um, what inspired you to, to decide to do the, kind of that speculative fiction route, that more um, science fiction without being fully science fiction, the near future, um, what was it that made you decide to, to write within that time period or, or, or the near future? You know, I think, um, so speculative fiction, if you're watching and you're unsure what that is, is it's basically anything that may not be happening right right here and now, basically. It could right. be sci-fi, it could be fantasy. Um, and it's always been kind of my first love, actually. And, I, and I'm totally going to date myself saying this, but I grew up reading um, Valentine's Castle, I think it was called. Uh, Silverstein wrote that. Um, Marion Zimmer Bradley's The Miss of Avalon was a longtime favorite of mine. Um, time travel books, you know, anything like that. And when you write historical fiction, especially if it's over a thousand years, I mean, you're, there's a lot of speculation that goes into that, even though it's historical. So I have to say that it's always kind of been something I've loved, you know, and I, I was the kid who loved Star Wars. I truly believed Luke Skywalker was coming for me. <laughs> when I was 10, um, you know, we sat around in college watching Star Trek, The, the Next Generation. So that's what we did. So I've, I've always been kind of a nerd, I guess. Best television, <laughs> one of the best television shows ever, in my personal opinion. Um, I had a thing for Worf. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, husband over there. <laughs> and Spike. Like, he was a strong, you know, masculine warrior type, you know? Uh, he didn't take any gruff, which, no. is, yeah. which is always, I mean, a great, great way to start off the show, you know? That's right. Um, and, and being the head of security, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. um, so what sort of world building is involved within doing speculative fiction? What did you have to do? Um, and is it very similar to your historical world building that you've done in like Iscariot and, and, and that? That's a really good question and it is very similar, um, except that when you're writing historical or fantasy fiction, for instance, the trilogy that I did with Decker, you're making those things up, but when you're doing his history or historical, um, you're digging those things up. So you're just recovering them from the dust, basically. But you have to fill all that stuff in. What did you like about writing the historical fiction? Were you, did you just get ensconced in the, the research of it? Yes, and I, I love the research, and I'm a bit of a, a research geek that way, and I love rabbit trails when it comes to research. Um, I. I literally spent a whole day once researching first century latrines, public latrines, because I might have needed it for this one scene and it only went into a sentence. But um, I love that part of it. Um, I love the fact that there's always another side to the story and another angle to that character that you might not have thought of, um, or there's other aspects of things going on in the, the societal or political situation at the time that inform the story stories that we think we know so well, you know, the story of Judas Iscariot, for instance, um, that cast it in a completely new light, so. But, you know, the Bible being a historical document or religious document, um, and then what we're able to gather from documentation associated within that time period and what we get from archaeology, I mean, that story is always changing and it's always growing, and so it's, to me, it always seems like so much fun to be able to get into the past and kind of dig into that past mm -hmm. and be able to kind of weave your story around that time period. There's and always be... something new. Yeah, especially with archaeology. And so when I did the story of Iscariot, Judas Iscariot, going over there and seeing the digs that were in progress at the time was especially fascinating. What drew you to the biblical story? Are you losing the I might, mic? I don't know if the mic's still on. Yeah, you might have. Did okay. I die? Okay. I'll trade you there. Okay. Yep, we're dead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we died in the middle. We died right in the middle. In Let's the middle. see if we, we have a... Uh, I've got more. Go ahead. I'll okay. be right back. So what do you mean to this story? <laughs> do I have to talk for a long time now? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was an editor friend of mine who said I had done um, A Fallen Angel. I had done The Story of Eve. And it was an editor friend of mine said, why don't you do uh, the story of Judas Iscariot? And I said, no, absolutely not. Actually, 
the first thing he said was, why don't you write the story of Balaam's donkey? Oh. Which, if you're very familiar with the Bible, and I had to look it up, um, is the story of this donkey that starts to talk in the Bible. And all I could think of was Mr. Ed. And I was like, okay, how am I supposed to write a story about that? And um, so I don't know if he was just trying to, you know, make the Judas Iscariot thing seem a little less outlandish or what. Um, so after I said no, I was on a trip and I was sitting by myself at a table, as I so often was when I used to travel for a living. And it was a table that had the tablecloth and then it had the paper on top of the tablecloth. And I was writing, which I would do sometimes, you know, just scribble on the paper table. Everybody does that, right? Oh yeah. Okay. So, and I had written a scene between Judas and his mom, you know, because in the story he has to be human. We don't think of him as a child or an adolescent. And then I thought, oh no, I'm doomed. And so I tore it off and I put it in my purse and and uh, told my agent and thought he might talk me out of it and told my friends and thought they might talk me out of it and they all failed to talk me out of it. And so that's how I ended up writing that story. What's the importance, do you think, of writers writing history and writing, um, you know, especially during that time period? Because I found your books really illuminating. You really gave us a good idea of who the characters were during those time periods. Thank you. Um, you know, I think writers are interested at their heart about interested in humanity and those things that make us most human and I think that we read to know that we're not alone and I think we write to know that we're not alone and so when writers are, are writing these stories we're looking for the connection that says that person might have lived 2,000 years ago but we are not that different and that happened to me scarily enough or not well, I was writing the story of Judas Iscariot when a third of the way through the story, I wasn't writing his story anymore. I was writing my story. This is my story. We are not that different. So I think that's that's the unique thing that writers bring to history. And also thrillers, because you're really giving us a very relatable heroine. Thank you. I mean, she's, she's fairly innocent, and yeah. unfortunately, quite you know, naive. quite naive at the very beginning, and then slowly, or not so slowly, really, um, that veil starts to become uncovered. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she's really realizing that she's not in a good place and she needs to get out of where she's at. And I think we've all had those moments where we feel like, this isn't, this isn't a good situation. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the creation of your character within the line between and um, kind of give us an idea of what she's thinking and what you were, maybe what you were feeling a little bit as you were writing her? Sure. You know, I really, I studied cults quite a lot when I was working on this story because they're fascinating. And the way um, that people are struggling to adjust after they leave cults is fascinating. And it's so easy to look and say, you know, how could someone get pulled into a cult in this way or whatever? But, you know, again, we're all the same. And, and at the heart and at the end of the day, we are all looking to be loved. And so it has a lot to do with that. Um, so it was fascinating to write about. Um, some things went horribly awry for her when she was in the cult. Um, there is an element of, um, uh, there, there is a, an element, let me just say like the Harvey Weinstein thing happened like right after I finished this book and I had just written about this whole um, situation, um, you know, with the cult leader happening with her. And I think that's relevant. I think it's relevant today with what's going on in the Me Too movement that started right at that time. Um, so um, that was really important to me um, to cover. And the other thing too is as she's going out and adjusting, she deals with PTSD and she comes to grips with the fact that she has OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is something I have. And it's something that I think it's been really important for me to talk openly about and to include in my stories because you would be amazed but the number of readers who have come to me and said, you know, I have felt so alone because I have struggled with anxiety or depression or OCD or whatever it is. And I think, again, you know, we need to know we're not alone. It's always, and it's it's very refreshing to add those human moments and, and what makes us ourselves, right? And our good traits and our bad traits within our characters um, so that they do become more human, they become important on the page, and more importantly, that our re readers really can relate to yeah. 
to that character. This is just me, and that's okay, and this is just my life. So. Exactly. And as a writer, you get to be very introspective a little bit about that mm -hmm. as well. Um, how much on the page do you put on that's your family, your friends, you? Obviously, you just discussed um, you know, your character um, struggling with, with obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there's always a little bit of every author in their characters. You know, we're pulling from the well of our personal experience. We might be changing it or packaging it differently. So winter is not me, but I have to pull from my own personal experiences in order to make her feel like a multi-dimensional, full-fledged you know, person. So, um, you know, she probably has some of my neuroses and, you know, I'd like to think of it as a, a sign of greatness, actually, having OCD, but, you know, that's just me, so. <laughs> it's, it's a superpower, it's not a struggle, so. We all have those things that we're struggling with, yeah. and uh, I always like it when a character has some real life traits that you really can get in because there's nothing more boring than reading about a, a character who's perfect or you know near perfect i mean discovering and, and reading through those flaws and learning how to deal and cope with them is is very important it's it's all that's one of the great ways that reading is so wonderful is because we're able to um to see ourselves to see ourselves exactly absolutely and I think, too, the things that we think of as challenging or that we might think of as weaknesses, they're only weaknesses when they're applied in non-productive ways. So think of that TV show, Monk, he has OCD, but he's a very good detective because of his OCD. So it's really about the application of the way you see the world and your behavior. So it really is a superpower if it's put in the right perspective, I really think. Exactly. So. We all have we all have our traits that make us strong. That's we right. all have our straights, straight, uh, traits that make us a little bit weak. What is it like a day in the life of Toscali in terms of writing? Can you tell us a little bit about being a writer and what it looks like? They're laughing because they know me. Um, well, if I'm between projects, I may not actually even be writing very much. I may be doing some other things like editing or whatever. Um, you know, I am not a morning person. I've tried my whole life. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. I, t I tend to get up late. I like to eat. I've got um, stepchildren, so um, I've got a very you know busy household. And then when I'm working, I work uh, obsessively, and so sometimes 20 hours a day, sometimes 24 hours a day. Writing is really different for everybody. Yeah. Um, in your writing environment, is it is everything have to be quiet? Do you shut yourself away? <laughs> Do you yes. or yes, I can't have music can't have anything. I used to be a ballerina, and so if I hear music, I start I start choreographing the music, so uh, I can't have any of that. It's too much of a distraction, you think, okay, I can do this, I can do this, or yeah. this is the perfect way and to seeing do seeing the, the steps the and dance. the dancing. Do you apply that to writing as well? I do, and I know that I'm not the only author who, who does this, but um, when I'm writing sentences, I was also a pianist when I was younger, and so when I'm writing sentences, I'm hearing the rhythm of the sentence. And so when I'm writing, I may not know what the words of the next sentence are, but I know it sounds like dun dun dun, dun, dun like that, mm -hmm. or it sounds like dun 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 dun, dun. you know, and I, I know the sound of the sentence, and I know this is really weird, um, but I, I, and then the words come for that, so. Mm -hmm. What was it like, what was, it like writing the line between for you? Um, that's a really good question. Um, this one I had to write a few times because you know the publishing industry is is very uh, changing, very tumultuous, and there was a lot of that happening at the time, and it really affected me when I was writing, and um, so I ended up having to rewrite it a couple times, and I was really worried about how this book was going to turn out, and I was halfway through writing the sequel when the early reviews for this book started coming in. And if you're not familiar with how that works, early reviewers um, get advanced copies of the books and they start um, reading it and then putting the reviews on places like NetGalley or Goodreads. And I saw that they were coming in, which I wasn't aware of, and I was very nervous and I told myself, don't go look, you can't afford to, to do that, you're in the middle of writing this and you can't lose your mojo now. 
yeah, like, I'm not going to go look. <laughs> 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 really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was like, don't look, don't look. And I was like, uh -huh. so then I went and I looked. And I, I li and I'm not even joking, I literally got off my desk and I got on my knees and I put my forehead on the ground because I was so grateful at the way that reviewers were responding. I was just relieved and grateful. So the poison pen motto is that books we don't like, we don't review. Mm -hmm. So that way, um, you know, you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings in terms of writing. And sometimes online, I think people get really mean if they don't like a book. Or you get that one-star review on Amazon because the book didn't arrive on time. Yes, we <laughs> oh, Yes, I have. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, that's just throwing off my number. Stop that, you know? And that that You're isn't helpful right me. there. <laughs> so that's always, you know, and I think as writers, I mean, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to put your ideas and thoughts on the page. Mm -hmm. So I always say that if you have a bad review or you have something mean to say, then just don't say it at all because it doesn't need to be put out there. You need to be, you know, you've got to understand what the author has gone through mm -hmm. to put this out and to put themselves in the... So it's always exciting when you have really good reviews. It is, and I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, I am of the opinion that if I can't say something nice, I don't say anything. That said, I don't mind when people are critical of the work and they, they have, you know, here's why it didn't work for me. It's the really vitriolic ones that I'm like, seriously? You know, but I feel like that's like when somebody cuts you off in traffic or they yell at you, you know, and they don't know you or something. And, you know, to you writers who may be uh, facing uh, something like that, all I can say is those people are telling you more about themselves than they are about you or your work. So um, that's okay. It's not constructive. And like you said, constructive criticism can be helpful yeah. in terms of becoming a better writer. What I felt and I've seen in your career in terms of being very brave is the fact that you're not afraid to take your time to write your books. <laughs> And I think that's really important because in the publishing industry, sometimes it's a book a year, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes that's too much. A book may not be ready and not, might not be ready to be born right then and there, or that story needs to be told right then and there. You're right. Um, there is the pressure to do a book a year at least. And some books can be done in that time period, and some can be done faster. Um, and I've had books like Iscariot, which took me five years. So. We will sell no wine until it's time, right? So. Exactly. <laughs> and I think that that's, but Iscariot was so good because I think you took that time to write it, to, to let it grow and mature the way that it needed to. And a thriller can be written a little bit faster, but I still think that sometimes it takes a, takes a while to recover after you've written and, and put, poured your heart and soul into that one book, and then you, you turn around and write the next one. It does take some time. Yeah. So what is the next book? I know you've got one in the works. Speaking I have a couple which... in the hopper, um, but one of the ones that's in the hopper now, and actually um, here in Arizona with me, I'm lugging around this giant ream of paper is um, the, the last proof pages of A Single Light, which is the sequel uh, to The Line Between, and it comes out in September. So that's the next one. And those early <laughs> reviews will be going up soon. <laughs> I'll be telling myself not to look, but whatever. <laughs> so what's the process like with you and your editor? You send in the book, mm -hmm. and then do they send you much review back, or, or what's that like? So um, there's always four edits when you're traditionally published, meaning that you're being published through uh, a publishing house. You send it in, you get a macro edit, which is kind of the 30,000-foot view you work through those things you may have to rewrite um, and then you send it back in and then you do a line edit so that's a little more granular and then you do a copy edit a little more granular then you're getting down to your grammar and your punctuation and all those good things and then you get that pile of papers and that's your last pass so if you've got something to change you better do it then and that's that's it so there's four edits and I've been very fortunate to work with very good editors who give me you know, great feedback. Do you feel like the line between was improved based off those edits and, and maybe some of the thrillers that you and, and uh, Ted Decker wrote? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I've worked my whole career with very good editors. And so um, every single edit 
uh, there's great feedback because these editors are experienced and they understand the, the flow and the rhythm of the story. And so, um, you know, I, I'm always got ears to, to listen to what they have to say. And there are moments, you know, when as an artist, you're kind of like, oh, I'm going to push back on this one a little bit. Um, but by and large, I find that, you know, they are the they are editors in those you know top publishing houses for a reason. Exactly, it takes a village to write a book. I don't. It think takes a does whole it. community, <laughs> and I am just part of the process. So. Well, you're the major process. You're the you're the reason why we're all here talking about oh, tonight. Your book. I mean, so that's that's got to be something commended. Oh, for you. for new writers, what do you recommend? For new writers, um, I always say. Write like uh, no one will ever read this. And the reason I say that is because there's plenty of time later on for you to be paranoid about what your mom and your neighbors and your shrink or whoever is going to think about what you wrote. But for now, you're in a very protected space. Um, you're not getting critiqued next to a blender on Amazon, right? right? So be brave and be bold and write that. And I also tell new writers, finish the book because I get questions all the time from writers saying, you know, I've got this great idea, how do I get an agent? Well, first you have to finish the book, you know. How do I get an editor? Is the book done? No. Finish the book. Exactly. Everything one step at a time. And you learn so much from writing that one book. Yes. And every writer, I think, has come in and said, and I think this is one of the reasons why coming to your local independent bookstores and coming and listening to authors like you speak is, a, in some ways, a better way of getting your own personal MFA Yes. Um, because they'll all say, finish the book. Finish, finish the it. book, yeah. And the only way to learn how to write a novel, or any longer you know, length or shorter length of you know, writing your short stories or nonfiction, the only way to learn how to do it is to do it. And that, there's a reason my first novel is in a crate in my basement with a skeleton next to it. Because it wasn't good, but I learned. That's how I learned. Exactly. And sometimes you can... Sometimes you want to dredge out that skeleton and make it work, and other times you don't. It just depends on who you are. <laughs> oh, that skeleton is dark and deep. Really? Isn't it? <laughs> it's just really messy and really bad. <laughs> I get asked no. about that a lot. Like, why don't you pull it out and publish it? Uh-uh. No. no, no. Let's not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not say we did. I'll write you a different story that's even better. Yeah, let me do that instead. Please, anything else? <laughs> so... Do you all have any questions for Tosca here? This is this is your time to ask. Um, Facebook, unfortunately, we can't see your questions, so if you ask them, we might be able to pass them on to Tosca. Um, but uh, yeah, does anybody have a question about you? What was what is your what was your favorite book to write? That's like asking like which which of my, of my kids is my favorite kid. Um, they're all my favorite. I can tell you the favorite at any given moment is the next book because it's bright and shiny. It's not a big pile of poop right now, which is when you're writing, that's what it looks like. Um, but you know, that said, you've always got like the easy child and you've always got the mischievous child. And so there are certain books that I think of, you know, like that. I can always say that um, I had a very personal experience when I was writing Iscariot and uh, Hava was always very close to my heart. Um, but I also really like these kind of like run for your life stories like I'm doing now. But it's always the next book because that's the bright, shiny, mm -hmm. oh, you know, thing. Uh, how do you solidify technical details like which direction a river flows or, or a highway <laughs> or, or something like that? Yeah. And I won't tell you why I'm asking. But no, no. Wait, did I'm I mess sure something you know. up? Oh, yeah. uh, I did? Oh, no. <laughs> really? Uh -oh. Well. <laughs> Remember, it's fiction. It's, it's, that's, that's right. I make the, all this stuff up. Um, I do research. I just do research. And for my historical novels, I've always uh, uh, had this cadre of academics that I keep in my kind of back pocket who are you know, willing to answer questions and share their expertise, um, you know, with an author like me. And we've actually formed long bonds through the years, several of these academics and I, so that we've become friends. Mm -hmm. So one of them actually married my husband and I. Mm -hmm. um, was a pastor, he came out, he said, don't you get married without me. So he came out and he married us. Mm -hmm. so. 
I always like the fact that um, sometimes we'll have series writers, and uh, every now and again you'll have somebody say, you know, you changed her hair color in the book, or the, the you know, the eye color, or something like that. So do you have people, and are, are you, um, how do you keep continuity now that you're writing a series? Um, part of that is OCD, part of that is I have to go back and look myself because I forget. And part of it is uh, that there are certain copy editors that I really like working with, uh, with my publisher, and I like working with them for that reason. So. I've got a friend who writes a series with multiverse characters. Wow. And I have no idea how she keeps track of any of it because it's just intense. It really is. And I can just imagine the letters you may occasionally get if you've, you've missed a, a, a detail or something like that. Is there, is there any letters that, or um, information that you've gotten from your readership that you really learned from or that you really kind of cherish? Um, I have to say that I'm... I'm being quite obsessive about that stuff. I'm very paranoid about getting stuff wrong. I'm dying to know what you're referring to, so <laughs> we'll talk later. Um, but I'm very paranoid about that. And and I, I've been lucky enough that, that more often than not, I'm getting comments from people saying, how did you know about that? So in the line between, for instance, um, Winter is learning this move in Chase, the, the romantic interest in the book says get your hooks in and one of my friends he does jujitsu said to me girl how did you know about getting your hooks in and it's like oh, I researched it so that's all I can say because I, I don't do jujitsu I'm not you know so you're not a martial artist that we know of as far as you know okay <laughs> <laughs> so when you're writing as a duo um who does most of the research? Were you the major researcher? Was Ted the major researcher? Mm. You know, that one, um, that one had a lot of world building as opposed to the research. So that was done jointly. So that's a lot of joint world building. And then there's, there's just a lot of keeping track of stuff. So Scribner's really good for that. What you what you do for the line between? Did you do a lot of world building for this? Because it felt like you really created a very strong feeling uh, near future. Um, well, I live in the Midwest, so that part was very familiar to me. The cult aspect was a lot of research, and then kind of a mashup of a bunch of different groups. So, um, you know, I didn't want anyone to be able to say, "Well, I this is that group or that cult or that." So it's kind of a mashup. Um, yeah, but that was a lot of research there. But it's interesting. I find that very interesting. So. But we were thinking about Jones and Koresh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jones and Koresh, yeah. yeah. So I absolutely did research them, along with several others, yeah. What scared you the most about learning about these cults? You know, what scared me the most is how easy it is to fall under someone's spell and cults always have uh, charismatic leaders. Um, but I think it goes again back to this idea that we all want to be loved and we all want to have a purpose and we all want to be of service and we all want to know where we fit in. And then the other scary thing for me with this uh, book was this prion disease because prions are real. And um, just in the last week they've been in the news quite a lot because of chronic wasting disease which is happening with the deer population throughout the US and so um, I've had a lot of people sending me that these news articles about that because um, it is real. It is. I mean, hoof and mouth disease, one of the, you know, mad cow, exactly. Yeah. Um, and they're kind of scary because you can't see them. You know, it is. You can't test for them. Exactly. It's just a protein that, you know. It get, folds and gets weird and it's always fatal. Exactly. And for people to catch it, it's just a horrible, horrible disease. Yeah. And uh, I could just imagine a world, you know, that's just been sort of decimated and sort of scary. You know, and your book, I wouldn't say is anxiety producing, but you give us some real anxiety <laughs> producing moments. I'm sorry if I moments. triggered anyone. <laughs> so it's really an intense, it's an incredibly intense story. Um, 
And so I'm just curious, I mean, in terms of that, um, what was it, I guess one of the things that I'm very curious to ask is that you've written some books that are very traditionally almost Christian in, in their, you know, they're often put into the Christian area of the bookstores, and then you're writing about a cult, and every now and again, you know, you'll get a bad cult that, you know, is producing a supposed religious method, message. So what did you learn that was the difference between maybe um, religion and the cult? That's a hard question to ask. That's a really hard question to ask. I think it really comes down to, you know, are you acting in, in a certain way because of rules? Are you acting in a certain way to be accepted by people? Or are you acting in a certain way out of your own personal integrity or your personal relationship with your God? So I think that's really kind of a difference. That's really, that's a good way to d express it. Because it's, um, she isn't um, expressing herself through her own personal identity throughout part of the book. And that's what happens with most of the people throughout this. Yeah. And so that's kind of, um, and part of the reason why this book is so interesting here is we do have some very famous cults that lived in northern Arizona, you know, and and you know, um, so it's it's not as far away from what we usually think it is. I mean, they could be right in your own town, your own city. They could, yeah, absolutely. There's there's much much more of that than what you hear of. All right, another question. Um, for your historical fiction, do you have any other biblical characters that are kind of rolling around that you maybe want to write about that's just been? Yeah, um, Sarah and Hagar. Mm. So I, I would really like to someday do a story with both of their viewpoints and then Abraham's viewpoint added in there in between saying, I don't understand women. <laughs> um, so I don't know when or if that will happen. Right. You know, I, it is so involving to write that kind of fiction. So, but that's one that would be very interesting would be. to me. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? How about Mary Magdalene? You know, she's fascinating, and she's gotten a bad rap, you know, because uh, she was not a hooker. Mm -hmm. um, she's portrayed that way. She was probably wealthy. She might have been a hairstylist, actually, of some kind, uh, according to some people. Um, I like her and find her interesting because of the bad rap she's gotten. So, um, yeah, you never know. But not Balaam's donkey. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> one, one more thing, and that's it for me. Uh, I watch a lot of National Geographic and other stations like that, and just recently, within the last couple of days, they found Christ's tomb mm. in Jerusalem and uh, un uncovered it mm. and opened it, mm. and they found nothing. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, why were they surprised? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, so I, I have not seen that. I would really love to see that. It's very recent. Yeah. Okay, so it's very recent. I remember, you know, a few years ago, there was the ossuary box, you know, which is a bone box, and there were some people who thought that that was, you know, the box of bones of Christ's bones. So, um, yeah, there's always something interesting with that, but I would really love to watch that. I'll check that out. My last question, since we're the question askers. Right? Okay, question askers. <laughs> So do you have any other books planned? And I missed the very beginning because the rain. I'm blaming it on that. Um, but do you have any more things planned with Ted Decker? Not at this time. He's got his stuff planned out, and I've got some projects planned out, too. So not for now. So. You never know. You never know. <laughs> I mean, publishing is a, a weird business, and timing is... Publishing is a weird exactly. business. I do have a project that I have co-authored with another author. Right that we will be bringing to market soon, so, yeah. Who else do you like to read? I like to read a, a lot of uh, different authors. Um, I recently was reading Blake Crouch, um, Dark Matter. That is one of my favorite books. Yeah, the mind-bending. Um, I've been starting An Anonymous Girl, which has um, been a huge bestseller. 
Yes, they were just here, actually. Were they? Not, yes, yes. I, mean, I actually wasn't there that night, but yes, the, the duo of... Yes, it's a psychological thriller. I'm, I'm reading a lot of thrillers these days, so... And you don't find that influences your voice, or do you find it helpful to kind of kind of keep a, an eye on on your competition, yeah. so to speak? Um, I like to see what other authors do, but if anything, I find that it keeps like the wheels turning and the voices going in my own head. So that's why I like it. But I read a lot of different um, genres, but lately I've been reading a lot more thrillers. And Blake Crouch's Dark Matter is probably one of the best examples of. Com combining thriller writing and science fiction, yeah. you know, uh, multiverse sort yes. of idea. Of going and he back did that with Wayward Pines, too. Exactly. Actually. And A.G. Riddle is another speculative fiction writer that I've been reading. He's got a new book coming out, too. Um, but Alex Kaba is a thriller writer uh, from my home state of Nebraska. Brenda Novak. Um, I've got a lot of friends who are authors. I feel like if I start naming authors, I'm going to get myself killed if I leave somebody else. <laughs> um, Alex is a good friend of the store, so yeah, you know she comes here for just about every book when she's oh, no. when she's writing. So we love having her here. Um, and uh, in terms of television, do you have anything? Television or <laughs> film or that you can talk about. I mean, sometimes you can't yeah. talk about it. We have some books in uh, development for TV, so The Line Between is one of them, which means the sequel is part of that as well, and that's really exciting. The Progeny and Firstborn are in development, um, so we've got um, some fun stuff happening there. Uh, we've got some others in development too. I don't know if I'm able to talk about them, but... Yeah. That's exciting. So more to come, more to see on Hopefully. your... What's the best way to reach you, I guess, and, and discover more about what's going on in your universe? Well, my website is toscalee.com, and I'm on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all the stuff that my kids keep me up to date on, so all those things. I'm everywhere. <laughs> Excellent. And for those of you who are on Facebook or who are here, we have this interview um, posted as soon as we're done. Feel free to share it out with everybody let people know all about Tosca's great book. Let's give Tosca a big round of applause. Uh, he did a pretty good. He did a great job. All right. Are we off? <laughs>